Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome uh, to this RSA webinar. My name is Dr. Meredith Doig, for those of you who don't know me, and I'm president of the Rationalist Society of Australia, which is Australia's oldest free thought group. Before we begin, I'd like to invite you to join with us in acknowledging the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their continuing connections to land and sea and community. And may I extend a very warm welcome to a couple of attendees uh, from the United States, um, David Biviano and John Adkinson. Welcome, David and John. They're board members of a group called the Genital Autonomy Legal Defense and Education Fund in the US. And uh, I know that Jonathan, our guest speaker, has had, or at least knows about your fund and maybe has had a bit of interaction with you. So tonight, what might be a squeamish topic for some of us, uh, but one which the RSA thinks is of major importance. Around the world, female genital mutilation is almost universally abhorred and usually made unlawful. But what about male genital mutilation, otherwise known as circumcision? Well, tonight I'm pleased to have an, welcome an expert uh, who's written a definitive book on the topic. And it's called The Final Cut, The Truth About Circumcision. Jonathan Meddings is an Australian writer and human rights ad advocate. Uh, the author of more than 100 medical fact sheets and co-author of peer-reviewed scientific papers and market-leading biology textbooks. Jonathan leads the Darwin Institute, which is a charity working to protect and to promote everyone's right to bodily integrity and autonomy in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, in his new book, uh, exposes the harms of male circ circumcision and is the only book uh, to debunk all of the arguments uh, that, you, that, you, that have been used to support circumcision, whether they be from the health angle, social, aesthetic, legal, religious, or the moral perspective. Now, as usual, um, I will invite Jonathan to speak for 15 or 20 minutes, and then we'll open things up to questions. I invite you, if you do have a question or even a comment, please use the chat box to note that down and we'll get to your questions um, if we can before the end of the one hour. There have been some questions and comments sent in beforehand and I'll give those precedence. So with that introduction, Jonathan, may I invite you to share, I think you're going to share your screen and take us through some introductory comments about your book and the place of circumcision, male circumcision in Australia. Yes, thank you, Meredith, for that introduction. And may I also begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet and pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. Sovereignty has never been ceded. Well, as Meredith said, I'm Jonathan Meddings, the chair of the Darwin Institute and author of The Final Cut, The Truth About Circumcision. Uh, at the Darwin Institute, we envision a world where the right to bodily integrity and autonomy is respected, protected, and promoted for everyone. And we work towards that by uh, advocating for everyone's right to bodily integrity and genital autonomy, and educating the public, medical profession, and government about the harms of non-consensual, medically unnecessary genital cutting, and other body alterations so that these practices come to an end. The organisation was founded in May of 2013 by a group led by former barrister, family lawyer and Tasmanian Commissioner for Children, Paul Mason, exactly one year to the day after a court ruling in Cologne, Germany, that found the non-therapeutic circumcision of a young boy represented grievous bodily harm and was not in the child's best interests. In 2020, Ager rebranded as the Darwin Institute, a blend of the surnames of our founder, the late Paul Mason, and generous benefactor, the late Robert Darby, who was a medical historian and respected scholar on the subject of circumcision. 
And if you'd like to find out more about the Darwin Institute, I encourage you to visit our website at darwininstitute.org. And if you'd like a copy of the book, you can find links to several retailers at circumcisionbook.com. So tonight I would just like to briefly cover uh, how common circumcision is, reasons why people circumcise, some of the harms and complications that arise from this procedure, uh, a bit of a focus on Medicare rorts with incorrect and fraudulent Medicare claims that are currently costing Australian taxpayers millions of dollars every year, and then finishing with a, a brief look into cosmetic surgery reforms that are needed and what you can do. So how common is circumcision? Well, almost one third of all boys and men globally are circumcised, of which 70% are Muslim. That's more than 1.2 billion boys and men missing, not just the most sensitive part of their penis, but in fact, the most sensitive part of their entire body. In Australia, some 10 to 20% of newborns are still circumcised each year. Now you'll note that that figure is getting a bit old. It's from 2010. Our best estimate at the moment is that it's something closer to the 10% mark, and that's based on uh, numbers that we have for Medicare claims, but it's kind of hard to tell because Medicare claims aren't always claimed when a circumcision is performed. So there's some unknown quantity out there that are being performed as well. But what's really interesting is that uh, a study from Denmark found that only half of a percent of all circumcisions are medically indicated. And you'd expect that we'd have a pretty similar figure here. And yet you've got the vast majority that are being performed uh, for medically unnecessary reasons. So why do people circumcise? If it's not medically indicated, why are they doing it? Well, globally, most boys are circumcised because they're children of Muslim parents. But in developed countries like Australia, which have relatively small Jewish and Muslim populations, most circumcisions are performed for social or conformist reasons. In other words, because parents think, parents think that it looks better uh, or they want the boys to match their father. It's important to understand that the foreskin is not a useless flap of skin like the earlobes are. It's highly specialized tissue, and with that specialization comes a range of functions. I've listed some here, but there are many others. These are just some of the main ones. Uh, these functions include sensitivity to sexual stimulation. The foreskin is the most sensitive part of the penis, indeed the male body, because it contains an abundance of specialized receptors that sense fine touch. Now, clearly removing the most sensitive part of the penis reduces penile sensitivity, but circumcision also reduces penile sensitivity by causing uh, the head of the penis that becomes exposed to harden and keratinize and lose what little sensitivity it has to begin with. The foreskin also offers adequate skin to cover the penis during an erection, which is why the removal of too much tissue during circumcision can result in painful, curved and shorter erections. It also provides physical protection, both of the head of the penis and the inner foreskin, protecting them from chafing and infection. And the inner foreskin is a mucous membrane that contains immune cells and helps to fight infections. And it may be the case that vaccines developed in the future for sexually transmissible infections require that intact genital mucosa to be effective. So that's the lost functions, but what about some of the complications of the procedure itself? Well, complications of circumcision include scarring, uh, and that occurs in every man who's circumcised, obviously, although it's interesting to note that many circumcised men uh, don't realize that they have a scar that encircles their penis where their foreskin used to be attached to it, and that's because the procedure was done to them when they're too young to remember it, Many grow up in a cutting culture, they're not exposed to intact men, they don't see any different, they don't know any different. But of course, a physical scar is what they've been left with. Uh, and there are many other complications, some of them are included here, blood loss, infection, buried penis. So that is where the penis would appear to be amputated, but actually it's just withdrawn within the fat pad that surrounds it. Penile adhesions, so the foreskin is normally fused to the head of the penis. That's natural, that's normal. Uh, the inner lining of the inner foreskin is fused to the head of the penis and it naturally retracts around early puberty, sometimes not even until 
uh, early adulthood. That's normal. What's not normal is to uh, forcibly retract the foreskin to break that adhesion, which occurs at the beginning of every circumcision. And that's when you can get abnormal adhesions forming. Uh, and that's a problem for a number of reasons. Urethral fistula, this is just a fancy medical term for holes in the tube that urine comes out of. It can result in multiple streams of urine. Metal stenosis, that's one of the more common complications of circumcision. It results in the urethra, which is the tube that urine comes out, uh, urine comes out of, narrowing, and that results in a narrow, high-velocity stream of urine. Kidney failure, penile disfigurement, amputation, gangrene, tragically death. Um, we saw a young boy uh, from Perth die last December following complications related to a circumcision performed by a GP and his his brother was also left critically ill in hospital, but thankfully survived following his circumcision from the same doctor. Uh, it's notable also that some men have died by suicide as a result of the psychological trauma of circumcision. Globally, most boys are circumcised at an age when they're old enough to remember. It's typically done when they're several years old in many parts of the world. In a country like Australia, it's most often performed on young children when they are too young to remember what was done to them. Uh, but often what you see is that men grow up and they start learning about the issue and reading about it. And that alone is enough to cause psychological harm. And many circumcised men do report feelings of grief, loss, violation, anger, and even envy of intact men. So that's a bit of background context there for you. Uh, now I want to talk through Medicare rebates for circumcision in Australia, starting with the history. And you can see that in 1983, the National Health and Medical Research Council found that ritual circumcision was both unnecessary and hazardous and recommended it be removed from the Medicare benefits schedule. And, and keep in mind, this is a time when circumcision rates were much higher than they are now. So they also would have been a much bigger burden on the public purse. The then health federal minister for health followed through on that in 1985, but quickly backed down and reinstated the rebate following lobbying by religious groups. Hmm. Fast forward to 2018, an NBS review task force was established and the urology clinical committee recommended that the NBS continue to fund circumcision of the penis for religious or cultural reasons. Now, what's interesting about all of this is that it presupposes that the, the Medicare rebate uh, is and should exist to uh, fund social or cultural or religious circumcisions. But in fact, when you look at the law, it clearly says otherwise. Uh, in 2020, following this MBS uh, review task force, the Urology Clinical Committee recommended that pain relief or and or anesthesia be a requirement in order to claim the Medicare rebates for clinically relevant circumcisions of the penis. And so the Department of Health issued a fact sheet advising providers of that uh, new requirement. And it also, in that same fact sheet, reminded providers that they have a responsibility to ensure that any services they bill to Medicare are clinically relevant and meet the eligibility requirements outlined in the MBS item descriptor. Now, we'll get to the meaning of that all-important uh, term clinically relevant soon, but I just want to run you through first the Medicare item numbers in question. So there's actually several that relate to uh, Medicare rebates for circumcision of the penis. I've listed only the main two here, 30654 and 30658. They both relate to circumcision of the penis, just with different levels of pain relief, you know, topical or local analgesia or a, a general or regional where someone's put under. And you can see here that the total in this table um, is, is a bit more than what those two numbers add up to. And again, that's because there's some item numbers that I've left out here. But what you can also see is that these two item numbers alone, when you add them up, account for the vast majority of Medicare claims uh, for circumcision of the penis in Australia. And what's also interesting, I think, 
looking back over the last four years, is not only that we've remained pretty steady above 20,000 claims, but that we've done so despite the fact that we've been living through COVID restrictions and lockdowns. Uh, in fact, you know, it kind of peaks there at 22,000 right in the middle of all of that. And that I think highlights the fact that circumcision providers were clearly flouting the moratorium that was placed on elective procedures in order to perform these unnecessary cosmetic circumcisions. Uh, and I think that's outrageous because they were doing that at a time when personal protective equipment was scarce and when they were using that up when it was needed on the front lines by healthcare providers that were dealing with COVID patients. And they were doing it, of course, because in Australia, the vast majority of circumcision procedures are performed in private clinics, almost always by GPs. They're not performed in hospitals. It moved down of the hospitals decades ago, I suppose, because they got good legal teams that didn't want to expose themselves to criminal liability <laughs> and not to mention civil. Um, but there you can see it, that they've continued this, even though they were told not to, because it's their entire business model. Um, and these circumcision clinics just basically have boys on a conveyor belt where it's all they do. And it's their income and livelihoods. So what does the law say about this? Well, Section 10.1 of the Health Insurance Act provides that Medicare benefits are payable for professional services. Now, a professional service is defined as a clinically relevant service if it is generally accepted in the medical profession as necessary for the appropriate treatment of the patient. Now, there's a lot of really important qualifiers there. But what's in interesting is that the Royal Australasian College of Physicians and the Urological Society of Australia and New Zealand do not recognise the routine infant or cosmetic circumcision uh, as necessary or appropriate to treat any condition. And as I've just said, we know that most circumcisions in Australia are performed in private clinics uh, in the absence of any medical need and almost always for social, cultural or religious reasons. So what that means is that most circumcision procedures currently being performed in Australia are not clinically relevant and do not qualify for the Medicare rebate. Claiming Medicare rebates for non-clinically relevant circumcisions would appear to be an offence under both the Health Insurance Act and the Criminal Code. So in other words, it's a criminal act, and it's one that uh, has a maximum penalty of 10 years imprisonment. Um, what's really interesting is that medical rebates intended for clinically relevant circumcisions for what qualified medical practitioners must by virtue of their medical training, know to be unnecessary and non-clinically relevant circumcisions continues to occur. Um, so what's all this costing us? Uh, well, 2.6 million in the 2018 financial year, uh, according to the MBS Review Task Force. So you can go back over the decades and that starts adding up very quickly into tens of millions of taxpayer dollars in rebates that have been distributed. But the cost I want to emphasize is more than economic. Children live with the harms of circumcision for the rest of their lives. And as I've mentioned, uh, some of those lives are cut tragically short as a result of the procedure. So in summary, Medicare rebates exist for circumcisions of the penis that are clinically relevant under the law. A clinically relevant service is one provided by a medical practitioner that is generally accepted in the medical profession as being necessary for the appropriate treatment of the patient, but our relevant medical bodies do not recommend the cosmetic circumcision of children as necessary for the appropriate treatment of any condition. And we know most circumcisions are performed for purely social or cosmetic reasons, so a boy looks better or matches his father. Medical practitioners at private clinics around Australia are incorrectly and in some cases fraudulently claiming Medicare rebates for cosmetic circumcisions performed for social, cultural and religious reasons, exposing them to criminal liability for defrauding the Commonwealth. And that's in addition to the criminal liability to which they're exposed under state and territory laws in every jurisdiction that relate to bodily injury or serious bodily injury or what's otherwise known as grievous bodily harm. Uh, 
I just want to finish by drawing everyone's attention to a Four Corners episode called Cos Cosmetic Cowboys that was released in October last year that really shone a light on poor industry practice in the cosmetic surgery industry, and it resulted in an independent review, and there's now calls for a Royal Commission. The Darwin Institute made a submission to the independent review, and what became very clear to us is that the guidelines for registered medical practitioners who perform cosmetic medical and surgical procedures do not adequately support safe practice that is within a practitioner's scope, qualifications, training and experience. Now, although the guidelines do not refer to circumcision specifically, cosmetic circumcision procedures are a type of major cosmetic surgery by definition uh, because they involve cutting beneath the skin. So they are captured by the guidelines. But the guidelines assume that individuals always provide their own informed consent for all cosmetic procedures. And clearly, most children who are circumcised for cosmetic reasons are too young to provide that consent. So what can we do here to resolve this? Well, the guidelines should make it clear that cosmetic medically deferrable procedures should not be performed on children until such time as they are old enough to consent to the procedure themselves. It should not be within the scope of practice for any medical practitioner to perform circumcision of the penis, which is a major cosmetic procedure, unless they're a qualified surgeon or perhaps a urologist with some advanced training. Major complications resulting from cosmetic surgical procedures should be within the scope of mandatory notifications and centrally recorded. This will help to identify practitioners that are consistently posing an unacceptable risk to public safety and enable appropriate actions to be taken. So what's happening now is there's circumcision providers performing circumcisions. Sometimes they're botched. When that occurs, people go to their lawyers, they get settlements paid out by the doctors, but then they also sign non-disclosure or confidentiality agreements. So we really have no idea just how widespread or what the scale of botched circumcisions are. And this also applies more broadly to other cosmetic procedures, of course. So what can you do? Well, you can write to your local MP to tell them that you want children to be protected from non-consensual, medically unnecessary genital cutting and that you don't want your tax dollars funding these harmful procedures. Don't shy away from talking about circumcision because it's an awkward subject. We owe it to children to speak up for their health and human rights because they can't do it themselves. You can join or donate to the Darwin Institute. And I'd encourage you, if you have uh, lived experience, if you're a survivor of male or female genital cutting, to consider sharing your story of circumcision harms through a campaign to be launched by the Darwin Institute next year. And if you're interested in finding out more about this, you can contact me at chair at darwininstitute.org. I'd also encourage you to sign up for occasional updates at circumcisionbook.com. And with that, I will hand back over to you, Meredith. Jonathan, thank you. Um, as somebody without a penis, um, hearing about all this is a little bit squeamish for me, and I can't imagine what it might be like for those of you who do have one. Um, and in fact, uh, can I encourage everybody to consider buying this book, um, if for no other reason than it... Uh, describes in minute detail um, the way that circumcision is done. And let me just read from um, one paragraph from chapter four. And this is the way apparently that the, uh, which is common um, under Jewish circumcision, it uses a an instrument called a mogen. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, a mogen clamp. Uh, and it says it begins with the forced separation of the fused mucosa of the inner foreskin and the head of the penis. This is followed by the foreskin being lifted over the head of the penis and placed between the open jaws of the Mogan clamp, which is then closed for a few minutes to crush the foreskin to help prevent bleeding before the foreskin is cut off after the point of the clamp after the point the clamp has crushed it. 
The clamp is then opened and downward pressure is applied to the penile skin to push it back behind the head of the penis. I don't know about you, but I found that a little bit difficult to read. Um, here's a question for you, Jonathan. It seems that uh, this idea of the aesthetics of a circumcised penis has not always been the case. In fact, you make reference in your book uh, to the ancient Greeks um, who apparently thought that um, a large penis was really only for... Um, uh, was associated with men. foolish or lustful <laughs> men or animal-like satires. <laughs> so when did this all change? Um, well, if you're asking when uh, larger penises came into fashion, I don't think anyone really knows the answer to that question, Meredith. <laughs> um, but I suppose the what I can tell you is that all matters of appearance are viewed subjectively and they vary according to time, place, and person. And that's precisely why when it comes to cosmetic alterations of people's bodies in general, or of their genitals in particular, that it should be a decision that's left for the individual who's going under the knife. Absolutely. Now you use, um, or you address a number of the arguments that have been used in favor of circumcision. And one of the most important, I think, is the matter of consent. And you have a very nice analogy. Would you like to take us through that, please? Um, I, yeah, I think I remember the one you're referring to around uh, smoking and child abuse. So everyone would agree that if you put a cigarette in a child's mouth and lit it and force them to smoke, that that would be child abuse. Uh, but if that child grows up and then decides for themselves that they want to smoke a cigarette, well, that's perfectly okay because they're doing so with all of the knowledge of the harms that are entailed by doing that as a, as a free person. Mm. Um, and circumcision is much the same. You know, I've got no problem with people growing up and deciding for themselves that they want to voluntarily undergo circumcision for whatever reason, uh, even if it isn't medically necessary. It's their body. It's their choice. The problem is when it's forced on children who have no say in the matter. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that you uh, address is the argument from harm minimization that, um, and you make a, uh, an analogy with drug law reform. So in drug law reform, we argue that legalizing uh, drugs like marijuana minimizes the harm because it prevents it being exploited on the on the black market but you argue that this is not the case not similar to the argument for harm minimization in the case of circumcision would you like to explain please absolutely and i should say i completely support a harm reduction and minimization approach when it comes to drug use and i think the difference there is we're talking again about individuals choosing to uh, consume substances of their own free will um, as opposed to uh, genital mutilation, which is forced on children. Uh, but the danger is that this harm minimization argument when it comes to genital cutting, it sounds like a rational one on the face of it. You know, it sounds reasonable to say that while genital mutilation is bad, very bad, uh, that it might be better to have milder versions of the practice performed by trained professionals, so doctors in controlled environments, hospitals, in order to minimize the harm in order to minimize the harm. Uh, you know, it sounds reasonable until you consider what you're really being asked to condone here. Uh, imagine uh, if I were to say that while family violence is bad, very bad, uh, that it might be better to have people uh, taken to police stations where they can receive milder beatings by trained professionals, police officers, in controlled environments, police stations, in order to minimize the harm. Now, I trust that um, everyone here would agree that that is an absurd and frankly disgusting proposition, and yet it is precisely the same logic that people put forward uh, in order to justify the general mutilation of children in healthcare settings. Mm. You know, that you can't minimize harm by institutionalizing it. Absolutely. Um, 
Let me turn now to a number of the comments and questions that were sent in uh, when people registered. And the first one was from Jeff Williams, who is with us. And Jeff, I'm just going to ask you to unmute. I made a comment in my um, comment in the chat that I was circumcised after my brothers had been, not because of any particular medical problem other than the inconvenience of my second brother having urine going everywhere. I realise it's not scientific proof, it's a mere explanation of why in our family it was done that way. I'll see if I can move into the picture better. <laughs> Sorry. And I have no recollection of the terrible event. It sounds terrible, I agree. I wince when I hear what is done. Mm. But I don't have any recollection of it. And I don't feel it has in any way impacted upon my life. And it's uh, not it's just simply been a non-issue for me. Right. Which so you might be glad to uh, know. Well, I'm very happy to hear that for, for you, Jeffrey. That that's excellent for you. I suppose what I would say is that there are uh, many men who've uh, in a similar position who don't feel the same way. Mm -hmm. mm. There, there was uh, a, an RSA member who couldn't be with us tonight, but she let me know that uh, she had decided um, against circumcision for her son when he was born. But when he was about six months old, uh, she was advised um, to have him circumcised um, because he had, uh, well, she called it a retracted penis. Would you like to make a comment about that, Jonathan? Well, if I'm understanding correctly what she's referring to, perhaps a, a buried penis, where, as I think I mentioned in the presentation, that's where the penis appears to be amputated because it's withdrawn within the, the fat pad uh, that surrounds it. If you were to compress the, the fat down, you would see it come back out. Um, it happens sometimes following circumcision um, because the skin is tighter and it, it constricts back. Um, but it, if it's happened even prior to a circumcision, I mean, you absolutely should not be performing that procedure because it will only worsen the condition. So I have absolutely no idea how that was recommended as a, as a treatment option in this case. It's outrageous to me that it was. Hmm. We have with us uh, somebody who also um, made a comment, and that's Phil Waters. Phil, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Uh, Phil, I understand that you are a retired um, obstetrician and gynecologist That's with correct. 35 years experience, and you took a conscientious objection way back in 1978 against neonatal uh, circumcision. Would you like to explain, please? I was a second year postgraduate res resident doing an obstetrics term as part of general practice training. Um, that was before I decided to go into obstetrics and gynae full-time in a peripheral Sydney hospital where I was asked to do routine circumcisions. And after two of them, I just decided that this was so traumatic, I didn't ever want to do them again. Um, at that stage, I'd done a little bit of research into the pros and cons and realised that um, basically about one in 500 boys might eventually need a circumcision for medical reasons. Um, but I couldn't see the rationale between uh, for doing 499 unnecessary procedures. And I've never regretted my, my decision. And Phil, just listening to Jeff Williams and his experience um, with uh, urine streams not being directable or going all over the place, I think, as he mentioned, would you consider that to be um a medically necessary reason for circumcision that was we've had a little chat box going here while um while jonathan was speaking mm -hmm. um, and he brought that up and i just made the point that that was anecdotal and what what the actual reason for that urinary stream difficulty was would be very hard to um, try to describe in hindsight um, but one of those reasons is possibly um, inappropriate attempts at retraction of the foreskin before it's actually retractable, hmm. causing adhesions. So there may have been uh, physical reasons for it. 
not to do with circumcision, but just the normal operation of the foreskin on the penis? Well, it's not usually retractable until the boy's about three or four years old. Um, and all too many people aren't aware of that. And so they try and uh, make attempts at retracting it or trying to clean it, which is completely unnecessary and always does more harm than good. Mm. Especially if they clean with soap. Yes. <laughs> the mucosal membrane. <laughs> yes. It causes a lot of UTIs. I mean, I've always wondered how many mm. doctors um, recommend circumcision for urinary tract infections without stopping to ask um, whether a, they forcibly retracted and washed with soap. I yes, suspect I, quite a few in the US. <laughs> I agree completely. And the US is a completely different kettle of fish. One of my colleagues is here, a man called Tony Krins. Yes. He, he's a fellow of our college as well. Um, I'm now a retired fellow, have been for four years. Tony, would you like to make a comment? from your perspective? I'm a retired obstetrician and gynaecologist too. And as it turns out, I started my medical career in the United States and took an interest in obstetrics and gynaecology right from the start. And in a large hospital where I was working in Denver in Colorado, <clears throat> I did extra duty in the labor ward. And at that time, a normal delivery consisted of a general anaesthetic and low forceps delivery of the baby at second stage and circumcision of the baby if it was a boy immediately. It was normal to, uh, to have all the little boys circumcised. This is 1970. And um, if a parent didn't want their little boy circumcised, there had to be a little note on the outside of the record in red not for circumcision when i came back to australia and started my obstetrics and gynae training um, <clears throat> having been trained to do the procedure um, the feeling was that it wasn't a terribly important issue whether it was done or not and so that people uh erred i think um into not worrying whether uh the, not worrying about the issue of consent and also not worrying about whether or not there was any indication for it mm -hmm. there was some thinking at that time that there were medical benefits personally i was never convinced by those um and having done it for a, a few short years when requested by the parents um, I took a decision too to, to not do it anymore. One of the main reasons was that the way it was done in Australia at that time, it was always painful, very painful hmm. for the baby. That on top of the fact that uh, this consent issue and um, that the arguments for medical arguments for it were so weak i took a decision to refuse to do it and if parents of babies i delivered wanted it done they had to go elsewhere good on you it seems to me that um the elephant in the corner in all of this is the role of religion and religious tradition and we have with us jeff lerner who um, has some personal experience on this. Jeff, are you willing or comfortable to share your experience? My, my first grandchild, my a grandson was born, well, he's now 17. I was asked um, to fulfill the role of what's known in Judaism as um, oh, um, sorry, it's just gone from my mind. The the person who holds uh, sand, the baby. Sandek, Sandek is called, holding mm -hmm. the baby during the procedure. Mm -hmm. And I was asked to do it and I did it. And since then, I'm, I'm filled with regret. And to this day, 17 years later, I'm ashamed that I did it. And I'm sorry that, um, that I didn't refuse to either take part or be present. Mm. Um, 
I wrote an article about this in the Rational Ma Mag magazine um, a couple of years ago. Um, I don't remember the exact month. Um, I'm sure Meredith can provide you with that information later. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I just, I can't describe, I don't have the words to describe just how much I could turn the clock back by 17 years mm. and refuse to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and clearly it's, it's a very deeply um, emotional memory for you. Yes, one that you yes. regret very, very deeply. Very much, yeah. Jonathan, can we talk about the the role of religious tradition mm. in this? And um, I was shocked to learn you in your presentation. You mentioned that in 1985, it was re behind the scenes religious lobbying that overturned the. Uh, Medicare rebate issue. So previously it had been recommended that male circumcision should not be eligible for a Medicare rebate because it was not in most cases um, medically necessary. And then because of religious lobbying uh, in 1985, uh, that decision was overturned. Yes. Um... Well, if you're a politician, you don't want to aggravate um, powerful lobby groups, uh, regardless of whether they're religious or non-religious, that's for sure. Um, politicians are weather vanes and they always follow public sentiment. So that's why I've always thought that to make any progress on this issue, we really need to get the public along with us and do that, you know, that hard work of community and public education so that people fully appreciate and understand the harms of non-consensual, medically unnecessary genital cutting. Um, one other thing probably worth mentioning on the uh, the religious um, topic is uh, the subject of human rights as well, because you often have religious parents say, well, it's my human right, you can't, you know, it's my right to religious freedom, I'm going to do it, it's my child, I'll do what I want. Uh, and I guess I think it always helps to just remind ourselves that children are not the property of their parents, mm. they're people, they're human beings endowed with human rights, just like adults are. And in fact, imposing a religious practice like religious circumcision on a child breaches the child's right to freedom of religion and belief because it denies them the opportunity to grow up and decide for themselves whether or not they want to participate in a religious ritual that involves the removal of a body part. Now, does preventing uh, religious parents from performing religious circumcision on their children limit the parents' right to freedom of religion and belief? Yes, it does. But I would argue that that limitation is suitable and necessary to achieve the legitimate objective of protecting children from the harms of genital cutting and on balance, uh, prevents more harm than is caused. Mm, mm. Um, do you have any idea how many boys are in Australia are currently circumstance, <clears throat> circumcised, what the rate is? Yeah, so what I mentioned in my presentation was the incidence. So that's in a, you know, in a given year, the number of new circumcisions that are performed, mm -hmm. somewhere probably around 10, maybe a bit higher percent. The prevalence, which is the whole population, how many boys and men are circumcised, it's a lot harder to say. Mm. Uh, given the declining rates over the past few decades, I'd probably hazard a guess that it's somewhere around 70 or 80 percent. In Australia? 70 yes, or well, it, used to be, it used to be very common in Australia up until around the 80s um, when it when medical peaks stopped uh, really supporting the practice and it moved out of hospitals into private clinics. Right. <laughs> we know that the number of people who identify as non-religious, the, the nuns, is increasing a lot and the number of people who identify as religious is decreasing. So um, would you expect then, so it, that seems to be consistent uh, with what you're reporting about the rate of circumcision, perhaps. Would you agree? 
Um, I'm not sure that the decline here is among religious communities, which again, are, they're only the minority of circumcisions in a country like Australia. Um, I think the decline is just due to the fact that uh, hopefully people are educating themselves about this a bit more and circumcised fathers are realizing that this isn't something that they want done to their sons. Um, One of the arguments that's often put forward is that uh, it's more hygienic, it uh, prevents disease, perhaps sexually transmitted diseases and AIDS and so on. Is there any um, data to support those arguments? We could probably spend you know, days talking about the, the medical benefits of circumcision. Uh, I'm happy to speak to them briefly, but I think the, the kind of take home message here is that while all of the medical benefits of male circumcision are debatable, what's not up for debate is that non-consensual medically unnecessary genital cutting is a breach of medical ethics and human rights. So therefore it shouldn't be done even if there are medical benefits to, to be had for it. And, you know, having, I've dedicated a chapter to this in the book, I've gone through every single medical claim and um, I found them to be either greatly exaggerated or non-existent, depending on the specific claim in question. Hmm. And just looking to the future, are you optimistic that the public education will increase and that parents will um, gradually realize that this is unnecessary and even if there were um, some benefits uh, hygienic benefits in the past that those sorts of benefits can be achieved through other means that are not so intrusive Exactly. I mean, you can wash behind your foreskin rather than amputating it if you want to <laughs> stay hygienic. And frankly, there's nothing hygienic about a bloody wound in a dirty diaper if it's been performed on an infant. Mm -hmm. um, I've always found that argument really um, an odd one, actually, uh, because it's often advanced for um, African countries where they, some of them may or may not have a clean water supply and, and it, it, it the idea is that, well, they've got no clean water to wash with. Let's just cut off a body part so they don't have to wash behind it. I mean, we're, we're spending billions of dollars circumcising Africa on the false assumption that it's going to help put downward pressure on HIV transmission. Why don't we spend it on giving them clean water to wash with if we're so concerned about hygiene? Is that true, that, that uh, there is still a push to circumcise previously uncircumcised African men. Mm, it's called the Voluntary Male uh, Medical Medical Male Circumcision Program, the VMMC. Uh, it's largely funded by the United States. Uh, mm. So you can see why they've been accused of cultural imperialism, <laughs> um, circumcising most of Africa. Um, it's called the Voluntary Program, even though uh, it's not just targeted to adult men and encouraging them to voluntarily opt into it. Mm -hmm. There's also involuntary circumcision of children. So the name is quite misleading. Um, but, you know, one of the main medical arguments that's been advanced in recent times is this idea that male circumcision can help prevent HIV. Mm -hmm. uh, it can't prevent HIV. At best, it can slightly reduce the risk of HIV transmission and in so doing prevent new HIV infections. Uh, it's a subtle distinction, but an important one, because to say that circumcision prevents HIV carries connotations of complete protection, uh, which can lead men to have condomless sex if they're circumcised, they think they're fully protected. Actually, we, we know that there's no protection at all if you're a man, who has sex, a man who has sex with other men. There's no protection for women. In fact, a, a study was done that found that male circumcision increased HIV transmission to women. <laughs> Uh, from men to women. And there's been a few studies done in Africa, randomized controlled trials that did find a very small, a 1.3% absolute risk reduction in HIV transmission, but they, they from, and only from females to men, that that protection was there. But those studies were so deeply flawed that you really have to take their results with a grain of salt. I certainly wouldn't be going out spending billions of dollars to circumcise all of Africa based on them, but that's what we're doing. So here we are. It's just, it's, it's a topic which um, 
is so surprising uh, for somebody who is unfamiliar with it that these sorts this can be going on so much um, effort money resourcing is going on to continue this tradition that even if it had some minor benefits in the past is far outweighed by modern medicine and hygiene uh, to say nothing of the um, gross intrusion into uh, human rights and the human human rights of children uh, it's it's just stunning that this continues on so what should we do about it jonathan uh, well, those calls to action that were at the end of the PowerPoint, please do consider joining or donating to the Darwin Institute. We're a volunteer-based organisation. We need all the help we can get. I think we're punching above our weight. We've, um, on the community education program, we've gone viral on TikTok and we've got a lot of educational videos out there. I think talking earlier, Meredith, you mentioned something about how we're going to see an end to it. Well, there's a lot of young people on TikTok, so you've got to get them while they're young, which is the philosophy of the circumcision providers. But we want to we want to get young people before they have kids and convince them that they shouldn't be doing this procedure. And it's through things like that that we're going to to manage to convince them. Well, hopefully the RSA can support you and the Darwin Institute in this crusade and and hopefully everybody here has um, had a perhaps some insight into this fraught topic, I must say, uh, and we should all support the elimination of this quite barbaric uh, practice. Mm -hmm. As I said right at the beginning, we all think that female genital mutilation is barbaric and should be totally unlawful. Um, but we seem to turn a blind eye when it comes to the genital mutilation of men mm. or boys. I think, you know, people throw around that word a lot. Um, and I used to when I first came to this issue. But um, my views on language have certainly evolved. And it's not a word that you'll see me using in the book. And that's very intentional. I think I think that kind of rhetoric and language is is probably unhelpful because, you know, we, we need to remind ourselves that even when it comes to female genital mutilation, uh, almost always it's the parents performing it on their children. And they really truly believe that they're doing the best thing for their young girls. We know that they're not. We know that they're harming them mm. in a great many ways. Um, but it does come from a good place and with good intentions. But of course, the best of intentions can have the worst of outcomes. And that's what we're seeing with genital cutting, whether it be female or male. And so um, I would just probably shy away from using language like that. And Well, Jonathan, the fact that you can keep your cool with a, a topic as, um, let's say, emotional as this, because parents and their children and the role of religion and so on, um, but all power to your arm. Um, I think we might uh, at that point call it a night and thank you so much, Jonathan. This has been an education and let may it continue. And hopefully in the years to come, you'll see the results of your public education with a greatly reduced rate of uh, male genital cutting. So thank you everybody for joining us. Um, again, we will have, let me see, we'll, we'll be in touch to see, to let you know whether we have another webinar at the same time on the third, fourth Wednesday of each month. Probably not. It's Christmas. We might take a, a break, but, uh, for those of you who are members, we will let you know. Jonathan, thank you again for a, um, very necessary and, uh, important topic and we'll do what we can to support you. Thank you everybody and good evening. Mm -hmm.